part three. <clears throat> Most goods passed in and out of Louisiana and the Mississippi Valley region through New Orleans. During most of the antebellum period, it was the United States' second leading port behind New York City. In the 1840s, New Orleans was also the fourth leading commercial point in the world in terms of exports, which constantly exceeded its imports. Antebellum New Orleans was the transfer point for American and foreign goods. There were more free black artisans and entrepreneurs in New Orleans between 1810 and 1840 than in any other city in the U.S. New Orleans was known for its cabinet makers. Several were free men of color. At the turn of the century, free blacks trained under a white cabinet makers. Yet by 1819, most free blacks were training each other. One was Jean Rousseau, who was active between 1813 and in 1833. He trained Darrell Brajan. In the 1830s, Brajan was considered a master, master cabinet maker. Today he is considered one of the few great cabinet makers in the world. Brajan established a successful shop in 1822 on the premier furniture making street, Royal Street, in the French quarters. His furniture warehouse, Brajan and Company, produced some of the finest furniture of the mid 19th century, made from cherry, cypress, and mahogany. Not only did he sell his designs, but he also imported furniture from Hamburg and Berlin. He introduced a different style to New Orleans, which was dominated by French furniture. This sleigh bed that you see here, this was signed by Brajan. It's in the style of the fashionable American empire or the neoclassical British regional style which was from 1800 to about 1840, which is massive. This type of furniture is massive, bold furniture, rounded corners, curved linear elements, including that S curve support that we saw earlier. Anyway, this was made from mahogany and the majority of Brajan's work uh, were his furniture is made from mahogany. This is also a bed that was made and designed by uh, Brajan. This is a new, this is called a New Orleans Empire canopy bed. It was signed and actually auctioned off. Um, I think this was on eBay. It was estimated to be 8,000 to 12,000. And this was about 10 years ago that this bed went for 8,000 to 12,000. Here's another version or detailed version of it. This is another mahogany tall poster bed, or as we call them, teaser beds. Uh, this is from the late American classical period. This is 1940. Here's another view of this bed. This bed was also found on eBay. Um, this is a classical furniture, very popular uh, e uh, even now, but it was very popular in Louisiana in 1830s with the decline of their very ornate kind of French Rococo design that was around. In some cases, very little is known about Brajan's career in life. Even though he's recognized as an essential cabinet maker, by the mid-century, he had financial problems. Then he gave his son his business. His son designed a different style of furniture, and then Brajan went to France around 1854 with his mistress. The company closed in 1867. And so I think this is a time to pause and think, hmm, interesting. He leaves his son his business. The company closed in 1867. We know that the Civil War ends in 1865, so his business manages to be open during the Civil War. That's pretty fascinating. After the late 1840s, the number of black cabinet makers and carpenter joiners decorative artists and skilled tradespeople declined by almost 50 percent throughout the u.s again we want to think about the time we're thinking about the civil war the end of the civil war let's talk a little bit about pottery the best known pottery of the antebellum period is the alkaline glazed wood ash or lime-based stoneware 
found only in some areas of the United States, such as Western Carolina, Georgia, Upper Florida, Alabama, Eastern Texas, and to a lesser extent in Arkansas and Mississippi. Edgefield District in Western South Carolina was the most prolific site in the region. It has the earliest pots that date from around 1810. In pottery mills or shops owned and operated by white prosperous farmers or planters, African American slaves outnumbered whites four to one. Skilled slave potters called turners specialized in certain forms such as storage jars. A slave called Dave threw pots for 29 years. Dave was born around 1801 and owned by a religious South Carolina planter named Harry Drake who taught several slaves to read and write to, and I quote, benefit from the teachings in the Bible, end of quote. Dave went by many names, including Dave the Potter, Dave the Slave, Dave Drake, and simply Dave. His most popular forms are large storage jars for things such as meat and lard. He's known for jars like this one, with a wide mouth and thick, rolled rims, often 24 inches, 60 centimeters tall. Only 20 of his enormous 25-gallon sign jars exist. They are dated and have a rhyme etched into the pot's surface. It's also theorized that Dave may have learned to read and write while working as a typesetter for another one of his owners, Abner Landrum, who published a newspaper entitled The Edgefill Hive. Dave's vessels are enormous, sometimes ranging from 25 to 40 gallons. Dave must have been strong because he probably had to manipulate up to 50 pounds of clay while kicking a, a foot or a throttle wheel. There's also evidence that Dave had only one leg, which makes his production of large vessels even more extraordinary. It is rumored that Dave laid on the railroad tracks when he discovered he was to be sold and relocated to a plantation in the West. A train severed his leg, making him less valuable to the buyer, who refused him. So, a one-legged Dave continued his work as a potter. He worked with an able-bodied companion named Bladder. His later pots are signed Dave and Bladder. This pot dates 1859, signed by Dave and Bladder, another black turner, is inscribed with the saying, great and noble jar holds sheep, goat, or bear. One of Dave's jars documents him having a new owner. Some have recipes for preserving meat. Others express sentiments about slavery, pride, and spiritual redemption. Most of Dave's verses offer insight into the condition of his life. For instance, the lines, and I quote, I wonder where is all my relations, friendships to all and every nation, end of quote. It may be a reference to the constant threat that slaves could be sold and separated from their families. Another verse states, and I quote, the 4th of July is surely come to blow the 5th and beat the drum, end of quote, is perhaps a reference to slaves being prohibited from beating drums because the white population feared drums as a communication device. This storage jar was depicted on January the 20th in Antique Magazine. It was made by Dave, Debre Dave, Dave, the, Dave Drake and is inscribed November the 3rd, 1858, Dave. On the other side of the vessel is, and I quote, I saw a leopard and a lion's face then I felt the need of grace, end of quote. Um, regardless of the source of Dave's literacy, Dave is known to have signed and dated over 100 jars, 100,000 pots, and 45 pots have verses on them. More than 150 years later, Dave's work and words are valued by collectors around the globe and often sell for sums in the low six figures. I would say in these days, it's probably more like the high six figures. Recently, his life story was, sold, was told in a book called Carolina Clay, and there will be a video that also 
talks about and shows uh, some of uh, Dave the Potter's vessels. Between 1860 and 1880, slave potters from the Edgefield district also created unique glazed stoneware face vessels. The pots varied in sizes from four to nine inches or 10 to 23 centimeters. They are referred to as grotesque jars and or voodoo jugs. No one knows which slaves created them, why they created them, or what they call them, or what they were used for. Most pots have been discovered in Thomas Davies Palmado Firebrick Works in Bath in South Carolina. Thomas Davies opened his factory in 1862 and closed three years later. He told ceramic historian Edward A. Barber in 1883 that his slaves were given time to make face vessels in 1862. This is what he said, and I quote, he said, they were accustomed to making homely designs and coarse pottery. Among these were some weird looking water jugs, roughly modeled in the form of a grotesque human face, eventually intended to portray the African features, end of quote. The use of two different clays, the open mouth expression and the white eyes contrasting against the darker colored form appears like Congo powered sculptures according to African scholars. Also the human face earthware is an African translation or may be thought to be an African translation of the British Toby that could have been imported into North America. Scholars need to learn the meaning of the pots. Some families kept them for generations. Others were found in around the Underground Railroad. They may not be utilitarian objects because of the location they were discovered in and their sizes, but again, no one really knows how they were used or what they were used for. Perhaps they have spiritual significance. Some of these face pots have holes. Ceramics with holes have been found on South Carolina and Georgia burial sites. Let's talk a little bit about quilts. Women dominated textile production in the antebellum period and after the Civil War. Women quilters dominated folk art. Slaves made most of the surviving quilts from the antebellum period. Black women excelled in making quilts called patchwork, applique, and embroidered quilts and coverlets. Many earned income from their quilts to purchase their freedom. This quilt was made in a touching star pattern at the Knob Plantation in Kentucky. The two slaves who made this quilt for the Mamaduke Beckwith Morton family remain with the family after the emancipation. It's called Silk Quilt by Aunt Ellen and Aunt Margaret from 1837. Quilting bees were part of the plantation community in the 19th century. They were elaborate affairs, either sponsored by the slave master or arranged spontaneously by the slaves. Of course, these parties provided socializing and reinforced community ties within the slave community. During the antebellum period, quilts were hung outside as signs. Those with color black in them indicated a place of refuge, a safe house for the Underground Railroad. Jacob's Ladder, North Star, Drunken path patterns all symbolize the Underground Railroad. This design that you're looking at here is known as the Drunken Path. It tells a slave that there's, it's a warning signal to take a zigzag route to elude pursuing slave hunters and their hounds in the area. A slave spotted traveling south, for instance, would not be suspected of escaping, thus the Drunken Path. Also, Note that free blacks and white women abolitionist organizations in the Northeast also made quilts to raise money for abolitionist cause. This is Harriet Powders. She's known as the mother of African-American quilting. 
she was born in slavery in athens georgia on october the 29th 1839 she died in 1911 there are just two quotes by harriet powders both were created after she was freed from slavery following the civil war they are the most famous and revered artworks in african-american folk art history former slave harriet powder created two applique quilts about the christian faith narrative quilts are famous in the americas and especially among african-americans this is the earliest bible quote that was exhibited in the agricultural section at the Cotton Fair in 1886. Powers created 11 panels of the Old and New Testament from stories she memorized from church sermons since she could not read or write, such as Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Jacob, the birth of Christ, betrayal of Judah, the Last Supper, and the crucifixion, the fall and the redemption stories. Second row, third panel, Harriet Powder says, this was the Bible story of Jacob's dream when he lay on the ground. Enslaved African Americans identified with Jacob for he was homeless, hunted, and weary of his journey. The angel is going up the ladder to heaven when slaves sang the spiritual. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. They long to climb a ladder to freedom. Adam and Eve naming the animals included three camels, an elephant, an ostrich, a sea monster, and a serpent. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you're wondering, sea monster and serpent. This is Harriet Powder's second Bible quote. It was commissioned by the wise of the Atlantic University professors who probably saw the first quote. It was exhibited in 1895 in the Negro Building at the Cotton State and International Exposition in Atlanta. Ten of the 15 scenes illustrate the Old Testament, including Moses, Noah, Jonah, and Job, and she includes scenes from the New Testament. Most of these stories are about, again, salvation and redemption. However, the second quote is a post-emancipation quote which gives insight into Powder's experience of being a slave and then a freed person. In the 19th century, as in the previous centuries, white consumers and urban environments determined the artistic culture of the antebellum period. There were a few examples of folk art from the late 18th century which show African forms and or African-derived content such as Taro's house and face vessels and powder's quilt. Once more, we have seen the Africanism was found in large black communities in the rural South, yet the American Republic demanded American subjects and art, and that America support those arts. Art was a mean of social hierarchy among all Americans and a way of transcending lower middle-class origins for people of color. African-American intellectual Edward M. Thomas stated in 1862, and I quote, he says, where the fine arts are not reflected, there is some great fault in constructing a nation and the individual, end of quote. By the mid-century, members of the free African-American middle-class community also encouraged and promoted African-American fine artists such as Robert S. Duncanson. Free Blacks hoped that education and individual political, economic, and cultural advancements would uplift the race. These race men and women with ex exemplary public presence expose misconceptions about race and gender, stereotypes, and, in and the injustice of slavery. Whereas on the, on the 22nd day of September, AD 1862, a proclamation was issued by the President of the United States containing, among, among other things, the following, that on the first day of January AD 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of the state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then therefore forward and forever free. 
and executive government of the United States, including the military and the naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any effort they may make for their actual freedom. Well, I can continue, but as you know, this is the end of slavery. And this is part of the Emancipation Proclamation. And this is where we will start the next lecture with Robert S. Duncanson. This is Robert S. Duncanson's painting called The Blue Hole from 1851.